know, the pressing question of today is not, is there a God? I don't believe there's anybody aside from a fool who doesn't believe that there's a God. Now, there are some fools who don't believe that there is a God. But any thinking person, any intelligent person knows that there is a God. They may not know who he is, but they know that there is somebody out there. This was not all just formed by accident. This is not just man's doing, that you step outside tonight and look at the heavens. And as the clouds do part a little bit, you'll see that there's a great deal more. You look at nature's handiwork. You look into the eyes of a person you love. You look at one of these children who was here on the platform this morning. There's got to be something that's bigger than we are that put all of this together. And so the, the question is the question is not, is there a God? The real question is, what kind of God is out there? And that's where we get confused. Is he a, is he a God who loves us or is he a God who's cruel? Is he a God who cares or is he a God who really doesn't care at all? Is he a God who is far removed, who has set all of this into motion and then has just left it alone to go on off and play marbles with his angels? Or is he, is he a God who interferes and intervenes in the affairs of mankind, in my affairs, in your affairs? Is he a God who's only concerned about big decisions like nuclear war? Or does he care about you and the fact that you stump your toe in the middle of the night? What kind of God is out there? Because you see, once we settle that, then everything else begins to come into focus. And until we settle it, we're going to be the most confused people on earth. It's important to know what kind of God is out there. Now, I grew up with a very twisted concept of God. That's one of the, that's one of the liabilities of going to Sunday school when you're a little child. And I'm not saying that Sunday school is not a good thing. That's something that we Americans picked up from you British that you sent across the sea. <laughs> you had it because you were working the kids in the mines and, and uh, somebody had to teach them. And so Robert Rakes put it all together and we Americans picked it up and we've made big business out of Sunday school now. But the problem is there's a lot of strange doctrines that get taught. And someplace along the line, I, I picked up the idea that God was cruel. That God was really a kind of a policeman, a bully, who was off behind the clouds someplace with a 2,000-mile-long billy club uh, looking for little kids to pounce on every once in a while. And, and that's the kind of God that I grew up believing in. I remember my Sunday school, school, school teacher talking about something she called the all-seeing eye of God. And that was a terrifying kind of thing that this big eye came down out of the clouds and followed little kids around and watched them with what they were doing and could see around corners and that was terrifying when you're nine years old and you've just learned how to smoke <laughs> and so I was constantly trying to hide things from this bully of a god this policeman uh, who was always trying to catch me doing wrong. And I and grew up with that. I grew up hiding from God and hiding things from God. And after a while, I realized I couldn't hide from God, that I could hide from God's people. And so I would pretend with them. And life became a, life became a lie. In lying to my parents, who played the role of God and who would beat me if I was wrong, because that's what God did to people, I thought. Later, lying to my teachers, who also beat me if I was wrong. And they played the role of God. And then lying to my coaches and my authorities and my military authorities. And finally, lying to my wife. And it gets serious after a while. Because pretty soon, you lie to everybody to cover up because you don't want anybody to know what you're like on the inside. Because if they ever find out, you're in trouble. Because that's what God's like. And so you can't even be honest with God. After a while, you've played the role so long that you become the role. And you become like the actors who play it over and over and over and over again 
until that's who they are. But they're really not. And Yul Brynner finally finished with the king and I on the Broadway stage after having gone through the role 6,000 times. He, he confessed that there was times that he really thought that he was the king of Siam. But he wasn't. The problem is that after a while you don't know who you are. And we role play because we do so much time hiding from a God who is, who is cruel and who punishes us and who enjoys watching us squirm and wiggle because we can't live up to commandments that he's given to us. And I never could understand that. Why in the world did God give us Ten Commandments knowing full well that we could not live up to them? Even the people he gave them to couldn't live up to them. Moses broke half of them by the time he got down from the bottom of the mountain. And then he gave them to his people and they broke the rest of them before the day was over. And, and all of that work by God and all of that struggle by Moses and all to no avail. And then down across the ages, nobody's been able to keep the Ten Commandments, much less all those commentaries on the Ten Commandments that the rest of the Bible seems to be made up of. And I grew up trying to keep laws and act the way I thought God wanted me to act because I was in trouble if I didn't. And we made all these jokes about lightning from heaven and everything else because somehow we knew that we were in danger with that. The standing story in the United States was I can't come to church because the roof will fall in. And sure enough, God visits us with his anger and his punishment or so we think. And so the big question, the really big question that we need to determine is what kind of God is out there? Because you see, until we know that, we don't even know who we are, much less who God is. You see, how then do we handle ourselves if we don't know who God is? And how do we handle the things that happen to ourselves and the things who we are? Well, we come here and we, we dance and we rejoice and we have a wonderful time and we, we embrace one another and we hug and we, we praise God and, and we let everything that is within us bless the Lord. But then we get out of the marquee and we go back to wherever we came from. And way down deep inside, we say, I'm really not worthy. I'm really not. If you knew me the way I know myself, if God knew me the way I know myself, he wouldn't even accept my praise or accept my worship. And Oh, he might welcome me into heaven be simply because Jesus is my advocate. But he really doesn't like me. How could he like somebody like me? How could he like somebody who thinks the thoughts that I think? Who abuses himself the way I abuse myself? Who, who really wants to do evil rather than to do good? How could God enjoy my presence? No, no. No, I'll have to be like Adam and go off and hide behind the bush someplace. And when God comes by in the cool of the evening, I'll, I'll have to cry to him from behind the tree because I can't ever get out and walk with him again in the cool of the garden because of the kind of person I am. And not only that, we find out that the closer we get to all of God's holy people, they're all the same way. Have you ever noticed that? That's one of the reasons that a lot of preachers don't like to get close to anybody because they prefer to remain aloof so that you'll think that they're just a little bit better than... They are, but they're not. And you find out the closer you get to people, if you get around them, that they all kind of smell the same way, act the same way, have the same kind of thoughts. I don't care who they are. The miracle workers, everybody. Hey, we're, we're not much. We really aren't. And so a lot of it depends on who God is because we're all caught in the same kind of boat, it looks like, of unworthiness. Because until we really handle this, we can't handle the things that happen to us. I have a friend of mine back in Florida, young fellow, 32 years old. He's a member of the church that we're part of. Came by my house um, several weeks ago. He's in construction work, and he had paved my driveway, which has been a dirt road for a number of years, and we decided we were going to splurge a little bit and pave it because Florida, like England, it rains all the time, and I was tired of having a dirt driveway that I kept bogging down in. So we, we, we paved the thing. And, and he, he came back by the house and he said, you know, he said, I really need some work. He said, uh, how about letting me get up on your roof? And 
spray that. We have in Florida fungus that forms on top of the roof. And, it, and he said, I can, I can bleach that out for you. And I said, fine, Mike, go ahead with that. And so he was up there working a week or so ago. And I looked out my study window. I have my writing studio in my house. And I, I looked out the study, and, and there he was out there lying on his back in the new driveway. And I that's kind of strange. He's supposed to be up there on my roof working. And, and uh, I went out to talk to him. I said, Mike, are you all right? And he said, boy, he said, I hurt. He said, I am really in pain way down all through this lower gut region here. And he said, I'm, I'm in really pain. I said, well, Mike, why are you... Why are you working? He said, well, I, I, I've got to work. He said, I, he said, I went to the doctor this last week. And he said, I've got some bad infection all in the lower part of my, of my abdomen. And, uh, and then he began to talk to me. He said, you know, I've, I've had some real problems. And I said, well, Mike, I'd, I'd heard you had some problems. He said, I, I think I've got them under control. Mike's 32 years old. He's divorced. He has a little girl, 12 years old, who lives with him. His wife has left him. And... And he, he has custody of his daughter. And Mike's been having a long-standing affair with a young divorcee who is in our church, another young woman, very beautiful, young blonde woman who works and has a job. And, and both of them are Christians, but they, both of them in their early 30s, and they're both fighting sexual temptation, and, and they both just gave into it. And so they've been sneaking in and out of each other's houses and Several of us knew about it, but you just kind of wait and see what God's going to do with all of that kind of thing. And, and Mike had finally made a decision that he was going to break the affair off with Patty, that he wasn't, going to, he wasn't going to sleep with her anymore, that he was going to pull out of that thing, that he really felt that if he was going to be a godly man, that, that he had to change his behavior. And, and, and he had, just several weeks before he had. And now all of a sudden he has all this infection in his body, and so he'd gone to the doctor and... And, and I insisted that he go for an examination. And he came back two days later. And he says, the doctor said, I have a, I have a, a cancerous-looking area all in the groin area of my body. And said, they're insisting that they go in and remove one of the male organs, one of the testicles, because he says it's cancerous. And I said, Mike, boy, that is really serious. And he said, well... He says, I guess I had it coming. He said, I, I've been involved in sexual sin. And he says, that seems to be somehow godly justice that he would strike me there with that. And I said, Mike, we really need to examine that. I said, let's just wait and see what's going to happen. And he said, well, the results have not yet come back on the, the pathology results. They sent a biopsy off to see what it's going to look like. And so just a day or so before we left to come over here. Mike was back by the house. And he said, the results are back in. I said, Mike, what do they look like? He said, well, the doctor did an incision, reached down there, cut out one of my testicles, sent the sliver off to the hospital. And he says, it's the worst kind of cancer. And he says, I have it all through the lower region of my body. And said, I, the doctor says there's not much hope. 32 years of age. And I said, Mike, how do you feel about this? And he began to weep. He's a big, strong, husky-looking guy. Good-looking young guy. And he began to weep. And he said, I knew all along that God would do this to me if I didn't stop sinning. If I didn't break off my lifestyle, that sooner or later, this would happen. And he says, here it is. And he says, I guess the best I can do is just throw myself over on the mercy of God. And I said, Mike, that's a good place to be, but let me tell you something about God. God didn't do that to you. God is not the kind of God who does that to you. There's something wrong with your understanding of God and who He is. Let me read you something tonight. This is from Isaiah, the 59th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 59. The Lord looked. This is beginning, well, let's begin with verse 15. 
Beginning with verse 15. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and that he was appalled that there was no one to intercede. And so his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Pause just a minute there. Here's a story, a picture of God who is walking across the face of the earth looking at the condition of mankind. And he looks and he says, there is no justice and there is no one to intercede. Things are in a bad situation among men. Sooner or later, we all are going to have to admit that this world is not going to be kind to us. This is not a good world to live in. There is no justice in this world. Turn you loose on the court systems and they will shaft you every time. The government does not love you. It is not looking out after your welfare. You go into industry or into the military or into any kind of job, your boss doesn't love you. Just mark it down to start with. Don't ever go into a situation believing that there are people out there who really want to take care of you. There aren't. It's a pretty tough place to live. It's a bad world to live in. And every place you go out there, there's somebody who's going to try to take advantage of you. This whole world is filled with what we call con men. They're the hustlers. They're the ones whose sole purpose in life is to take your money. And if they can't get that, they'll take your life. It's a bad place to live. You ought to try to find someplace else. This is not a really good planet to be alive on tonight. I tell my kids, I say... When you begin to realize that there is no justice in this world, when you begin to realize that nobody's going to treat you fairly, when you begin to realize that this world is not a fair place to live, then you are entering spiritual maturity. You begin to understand. And then you won't be disappointed when somebody beats you up out there in the street. You won't be disappointed when you get out there and folks are... Angry at you. I jogged some this afternoon. I got out and run along the highway. People were shouting at me. I thought, I'm back home again. This is what they do in the States. <laughs> hey, come on. You bloke. Run faster. Run slower. You know, they're shouting at you out the window. I'm just kind of trudging along, minding my own business. How come folks are shouting at me out the window when I'm... I don't know. Most of them are fat people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, I... My rejection syndrome is, I've pretty well got that thing under control when I'm out there running. I know that just getting out there running makes people angry for some reason. They don't like to see folks who are out there doing that. And so they're going to react against that. That's the world. That's the way the world is. Well, the Bible says that God came down and was jogging up and down the street. And he looked around and he was displeased that there was no justice. The truth was nowhere to be found. And he saw that there was no one who was going to intercede. And so, verse 17, he put on righteousness as his breastplate. And he put on garments of vengeance. And he wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. God said, if there's no one who's going to act justly, then I will. If there's no one who's going to be fair, then I'll be fair. If there's no one who's going to stand up from right, then I will stand up for right. And he came down and he rolled up his sleeves and he showed his muscle and he exhibited himself to the world and said, this is the kind of God I am to a world that's unfair. He revealed himself. God is a tough God. But notice to whom he is a tough God. He is a tough God to his enemies. To his enemies to those who are unjust, to those who do not love him, to those who blaspheme against him, to his enemies. Read on. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory, for he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. And a far better translation of that in verse 19 is this, for when the enemy comes in, Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord 
will put him to flight, or God will raise up a standard against the enemies of the Lord. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will put him to flight. So I said to my young friend, Mike, I said, I want you to nail down one point. And if you don't nail down anything else in the midst of all of this problem you're having, I want you to nail this down. God is not against you. God is not against you. God does not visit sickness upon his children. Sickness is God's enemy. Death is God's enemy. God may chastise his children, but he does not chastise them with sickness and he does not chastise them with death. These things are the enemy of God. God does not chastise his children with poverty. Poverty is an enemy of God. If God punishes you, it'll be in a whole different way, but it'll not be by making you sick. It'll not be by giving you terminal cancer. It'll not be by making you poor. God wants you to be, and you can mark this down, God wants you to be happy, and God wants you to be healthy, and God wants you to be prosperous, and God wants you to be at peace with all mankind and with yourself and with all of nature. That's at the very heart of the gospel. God wants you happy. He wants you filled with joy. If you don't have joy, it's not because God has taken it away from you. Because God wants you to have it. That's something He's promised to you. God wants you healthy. All through the Scriptures, we find that God is a God of health who wants you healthy. How healthy? Healthy enough to do whatever He's asked you to do. That's how healthy. Health is relative. So God wants you healthy enough to do what He wants you to do. He wants you prosperous. How prosperous? Prosperous enough to do what He wants you to do. Now, He calls each one of us to do different things, so we will all prosper at a different level. Some will prosper more than others, but we will all prosper to the extent that we can accomplish that which God has asked us to do. And so I don't need a whole lot of money because God has not asked me to do a whole lot of things. There are some folks that God has given commands to to build huge things, and they need a lot of money to get that done, and God will give it to them. And so they will prosper at a different level from the level I am. I drive a pickup truck. I'm very happy with driving a pickup truck. I like driving a pickup truck. My wife doesn't like driving it, but I I enjoy driving a, 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 little, a little truck. That's, that's all I need for what I do because my prosperity does not depend on what kind of automobile uh, I drive. Now, I've got a first-rate word processor. I mean, I've got an expensive piece of equipment as a word processor because I need that. That's where God is prospering me in that particular area. Prosperity comes and always relates to the thing that God has asked you to do. God wants you prosperous. He does it. God will never take away prosperity from you because He wants you to be prosperous. He will not punish you in those areas. He wants you to be at peace. He wants you to be at peace with yourself and with God and with all mankind. God has nailed those things down. That's where it is. God is for you. Now, his arm may be turned against the enemies of God. But if you are a lover of God, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't care how poor a follower you are or how little love you have for God. If you love God and if you follow Jesus Christ, then God is for you. He's on your side. He goes to bat for you. All of his gifts are for you. That's who God is. Nail it down. God doesn't go around with a big billy club slapping his kids on the head. He doesn't do that. He doesn't walk around looking for little kids who smoke so that he can stomp them into the ground. God doesn't do that kind of thing. God's not that kind of God. He's a God of love. He's a God who's for his people. And when the enemy comes in, God drives the enemy out. What's the enemy of God? Disease is the enemy of God. Sickness is the enemy of God. Poverty is the enemy of God. Death is the enemy of God. Scripture's filled with all that kind of stuff. That's who the enemy of God is. God is a God who loves to bless His kids. Loves to bless His people. Look with me at something. You, you, you got your Bible? See if you can find the book of Deuteronomy. Take you a few minutes. If you don't find it, why well, just listen to me and I'll read it to you. 
book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus. It's the fifth book of the Bible. Take my word for it. Deuteronomy. 28th, 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. The 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy is filled with two kinds of things. It's the blessings and the cursings. The blessings and the cursings. There's about four times as many cursings as there are blessings in here. But you need to understand that the cursings are for those who disobey God and the blessings are for those who obey God. You say, well, how do I obey God? You obey God by saying you love Him. That's all you can do. God doesn't judge you on your behavior. He judges you on your heart. He looks at your heart. What is your attitude towards God? If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow the commands that I give you today, Moses is saying, the Lord God will do some things for you. This is just to show you how God is for you. He will set you on high above all the nations. All the blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you will obey the Lord your God. And then there's a whole long list of these wonderful things that God wants for you. You will be blessed in the city and you will be blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Your children will be blessed and your grandchildren will be blessed. And the crops of your land and the young of your livestock and the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flocks, the basket and the kneading trough. God wants to bless your kitchen God wants to bless your refrigerator and your pantry. He loves to bless your oven. God wants good things, ladies, to come out of your kitchen. And you can claim this. And you'll be the envy of all of the folks around because there'll be good smells coming out of your window, out into the, into the community in which you live. God will bless your basket and He will bless your kneading trough. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. God promises protection for his folks. Jackie and I were driving to the airport uh, Friday to get ready to catch the plane to come over here. We did what we always do. We said, Lord, we're going to claim your blessing of protection in two areas. We're going to claim it on us as we travel, and we're going to claim it on our loved ones that we're leaving behind. We thank you that you've put an angel who hovers over our house and protects our house and all of the belongings that are left behind because you have given those to us. And so they're in your safekeeping because we're not going to be there. As soon as we get home, we'll take care of them. But while we're gone, there's nobody there. You take care of them. You put your angel to take care of those things. And we walk in God's protection. We believe that we can walk under His sovereign protection. That's part of the blessing that God has promised for us. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. In other words, there's no need for you to struggle or to fight. God fights your battles for you. He's for you. God is on your side. And God's bigger than everybody else. He doesn't even really need you to fight. If you just step out of the way, He'll handle the enemies. This is what He's, this is what he's saying. There's no need to struggle. Let me give you a little interesting example of how this is playing off in today's world. This promise was given to the nation of Israel. It's still in effect with the nation of Israel. I picked up the Jerusalem Post this last week and read an interesting little news article. We talk about all the terrorism that's taken place and with what's happening in Libya and all the terrorism that's coming out of the Arab world in particular and especially out of Libya and out of Syria. And I think we all realize that the, that the, 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 the terrorists are really not mad at the United States of America, nor are they mad at, at, at Great Britain. They're not mad at Margaret Thatcher or at Ronald Reagan. Who they're really angry at is the Jews. They're terrorists. The real enemy of all of those who are operating in terrorism today is the nation of Israel. But because we have befriended the nation of Israel, because we have stood by that tiny little nation over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, then the wrath of the Arab world is being poured out in many areas towards those who have stood with the nation of Israel. But God has a way of being true to His promise. This promise was given to the nation of Israel. So I picked up this little news article in the Jerusalem Post that says a very interesting thing has begun to happen. You know, Israel has a national airlines. It's called El Al. It is not run by private concerns, as many airlines are, but is actually owned and operated by the federal government. In the, in the nation of Israel. It's the only airline, by the way, that flies nonstop from the United States directly to Tel Aviv. 
All the other airlines, the European airlines, all stop. If we fly British Air, it stops in London. If we fly KLM, it stops in Amsterdam. If we fly Alitalia, it stops in Rome. And that's where all the terrorism has been taking place, been taking place there. So as a result of that, El Al, with their high security, both in the United States and in Tel Aviv, the people are beginning to say, this must be a safe airline to flying on. So, unfortunately, they're canceling out on British Air and they're canceling out on KLM and, and Swiss Air and Alitalia and all the rest. And they're all scheduling their flights with El Al Airlines. And so in the midst of all the terrorism against the airlines, El Al is now 110% booked over when it's ever been before. The airline is prospering. And where all of the attack has been directed toward the nation of Israel... That little national airlines run by the Jews is prospering simply because God's promise across the ages remains true, that I will be against the enemies of God's people and I will be with my people. I will provide and I will bless and I will protect those who stand for me and claim the name of Jehovah. And so we're seeing it all across the world. We're seeing how God's blessing is still being poured out. We don't need to fight God's battles for Him. I wish we could nail that down someplace, that we don't need to struggle and do God's work for Him. So many of us are so active defending the faith. I've got a little note here in the front of my Bible. This is Jamie. You cannot defend the Holy Spirit and reveal Him at the same time. I don't need to defend what God is doing. I'm not fighting God's battles for him. God is fighting my battles for me. And there's a big difference in that kind of thing. I was reading a story just the other day. An airline pilot, friend of mine, was talking about those early fighter planes that flew over Belgium and France during World War I. We had one of our ace pilots, Eddie Rickenbacker, used to get up there and duel with a uh, fella called the Red Baron who came from Germany and they all these gentlemen duels that took place in the in the skies over over France and and and, and over Belgium over above the trenches in, in in World War 1 and those those early fighter planes those little bi-wing flight fighter planes uh, they had strange kind of engines on them this was before the uh, the day of the adjustable throttle on the plane so the engines only ran at one speed full I mean full power. There was no throttle in the, in the cockpit. So the moment you crank that thing up, you better have it pointed in the right direction down the runway because it was going to take off. And they always some luckless private was the guy who was out there who was going to prop that thing by pulling, the, pulling the, the propeller through and then leap out of the way because, ooh, there it would go, flying into the air. Now, that was fine as long as it was flying, but the problem always got in getting it back on the ground again because, you know... That you, you fly an airplane by throttling back and throttling back and throttling back until it reaches stall speed just inches above the ground and then it settles down on the runway. But when you're coming in at full throttle, it was hard to do that. So the, air, the airplanes all had a, a little bleeper switch on the joystick, on the, on the stick itself, uh, that, that cut the engine off. And so when the planes would come in for a landing, you would have to stop the engine. And then you could click it back on again. It was like turning the ignition off in the car and then turning it back on and turning it off and turning it back on. As long as the prop was still windmilling, why well, it would pick up and it would fire back in. And so the planes would come in. <clears throat> silence, full throttle. Silence, full throttle. Until you just kind of flew the thing into the ground. Much later, the adjustable throttle was developed where you could actually slow the plane down while it was in air. I thought, my goodness, I know a lot of people like that. A lot of Christians like that. Uh, we call them type A kind of people. They, they go full blast all the time. I mean, they get up in the morning, they don't even get their pants on before they're praising God and shouting and, and fighting the devil and pulling down all the angels from heaven. They go, through, they go through life all the way through life like this. They finally go to bed at night just exhausted, totally exhausted. Fighting, battling, doing God's work for him. The problem is they don't last very long. They burn their engines out. And us slow guys, we, we pass them over there on the side of the road, all burned out over there. They kind of wave at us as we go by. And we chug on down the road at about half throttle. We, we don't get there as fast, but we're going to finish the race. And God is saying, you don't need to fight my battles. Let me do that for you. 
I am for you, not against you. God is on your side. Let me tell you a story, and then I'll probably need to quit with this. I was in Jerusalem, 1976, for the Second World Conference on the Holy Spirit. We, um, we had had the World Conference on the Holy Spirit the year before and decided we should go ahead and have another one. And there was 5,000 people uh, that showed up from all over the world. It was the largest, at that particular time, it was the largest gathering of Spirit-filled Christians ever to gather since Pentecost. And uh, the largest gathering of Christians of any kind to ever gather in the city of Jerusalem. And we had... I was on the program committee and was, was heading up the, uh, the platform, uh, all of the things that were heading from the platform. And we had brought in the, the real big guns, the, uh, the superstars of Christendom. Uh, we had brought to, uh, to Israel. Bob Mumford was supposed to come. Bob didn't come that year, but he had been invited. Pat Robertson was there uh, from our Christian Broadcasting Network in, uh, uh, in, in America. Uh, and an Anglican priest from England, Tre- Trevor Deering, was there. Trevor, was, his healing ministry was really taking off at that time. And then we'd invited Catherine Kuhlman, who was, who was the, uh, perhaps the, the most famous healing minister since John the Baptist, really. Uh, and uh, and it was a, we really expected a big thing. We had, we had rented out, hired out the, um, the sports arena in Tel Aviv. Uh, which would seat 10,000 people. And we had 6,000 folks who had come in for the conference, and we were expecting another 4,000 Israelis to join us for a miracle service that Catherine Kuhlman was going to conduct in the sports arena in Tel Aviv. And we met, and, and uh, there was 4,000 Jews there, and uh, uh, they had come in for the, for the show. They didn't know what the healing ministry was going to be like, but it was, it was a, a mixture of people. And there were a whole lot of things that I'll not go into here this evening that worked against us even before we got there and worked against us that night. And, and Miss Kuhlman was there, but something had happened in her life and there were some problems that were going on. Anyway, it's the only meeting, and I had attended many, many of her meetings, but it's the only meeting that I ever attended that the anointing of God was not on. It was the only healing service that I'd ever been in where Catherine Kuhlman was ministering, that no one was healed that night. She had told me earlier, she said, if I ever go into a meeting and the anointing of God is not on me, I'm asking God to take me home. And he did. She ministered that night in Tel Aviv. She came back to the United States, had one service in Los Angeles, and she died. Life was over. It was, it was gone uh, for her. But we had that terrible fiasco of a meeting in Tel Aviv, and everybody had come expecting the miracles to happen. There were no miracles. We expected healings to take place there. There were no healings. Um, God was not there, it didn't seem. It was just a bad evening, and, and the word of knowledge went forth, and nobody responded to it. Uh, it, it. Just gloom settled over the whole meeting, and a number of the Jews who were there walked out, and there was all kinds of insults that were hurled, and it was, a, it was a disaster. This was the opening night of the uh, World Conference on the Holy Spirit. And it started with this terrible disaster, spiritual disaster. And we went back to Jerusalem the next night for the second meeting. And Pat Robertson was supposed to speak that night. And, and I didn't even want to come to the platform. I was so down, so disappointed. Uh, over the whole thing. I went way back up in the balcony and sat far back there, just as far back as I could go, got somebody else to preside on the platform. And, and, and Pat spoke, and, and he spoke on the, just a simple sermon on, on the cross of Jesus and on the blood of Jesus. And he preached on and on and on and on and on. And on. I mean, hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. And I said, oh, dear Jesus, let's get this thing over with. I mean... The thing has already gone bad enough the night before, and then we get this long-winded preacher who's just going on and on and boring. I mean, everybody's just kind of sitting there waiting to try to get the whole thing over with so they could get on out. And, oh, it was really bad. And finally, came to a close, and he said, "Now, he said, before I 
before we get out of here tonight. He said, I, there's, a, there's a couple of fellas, folks that I've met here who are here from Kenya, West Africa. A little black couple. I was thinking about Johnny being here on the platform. A little black couple from Kenya. And he said, I want them to come to the platform and lead us in a closing prayer before we dismiss. And he brought them on up to the platform. little short fella. A little fella by the name of uh, Manasseh. And he had a little woman with him. And I wasn't even sure whether she was his wife or his sister or his girlfriend. I, but her name was Margaret. Some of you may know Margaret and Manasseh. But they were there from Kenya. And they were dressed in their tribal clothes. And they came to the platform and very nondescript looking people to, to lead in the closing prayer. And uh, it was an interesting thing that happened that evening. Uh, Margaret came and she stood way back over on the side of the platform like this. And she's a very shy little black woman dressed in all this fancy African regalia. And she just stood back over here and began to pray. Pray, 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 pray. That's all she did. Just pray. She didn't say a word. She just pray. And little Manasseh came to the platform. He's a short little guy. And all you could see was just his head sticking over the pulpit. He looked like this. Just this much of it. Just little black head sticking right up over the top of this pulpit. And he came to this pulpit and he did what he did what Moses did. Remember when there's a story in the book of Numbers of when Moses would come out of his tent early in the morning and look up at the sky and the cloud was gone. Remember the cloud was the anointing that hung over the children of Israel and as long as they were under the anointing they could stay at that place but if they came out and the anointing was gone then they had to move. They had to pack their tents and get on the way. And, and, and Moses had a war cry that he used. If the anointing was gone then they had the war cry. And, and Manasseh used that war cry and he stood with just his little black head sticking up over the top of this pulpit and his hands raised like this and he said... Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. That little Kenyan accent. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And here's Margaret. Pray, 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 pray. That's all she's doing. And he continued to scream like this. That's all he did. I thought, I thought the guy was going to lead in a closing prayer. <laughs> and he's shouting, let God arise, waving his hands like this. And I'm way back up there in the balcony. And the man sitting beside me, I don't know who he was, stood up and collapsed into the aisle. Oh, just... I said, my goodness, what's happened? And I looked over the edge of the balcony and there was people all out there in that huge crowd of 6,000 people standing up and falling down. And I looked around me and it was happening all around the room. Folks were trying to get up. Let God arise. And the moment they stood up, they fell down. And I realized that something was happening in that room. Something different. <laughs> and I didn't know what was going on. But folks were falling down and they would stand up. They would climb to their feet again. And they would try to stand up. And down they would go. And the aisles were filled with people. And then I looked over the front edge of the balcony. And they're crawling on their hands and the knees. <laughs> down to the front. I mean, here's folks all dressed up with nice suits and ties on and all these fancy women who had come from all over Europe and every place. And they're crawling on their hands and their knees trying to get down to the front where this little African is shouting and screaming down there. Let God arise. And his enemies be scattered. And I saw what they were doing. They were coming to the edge of the platform. And they were holding on to the edge of the platform. The power of God was so great in that room, nobody could stand up. The only way you could get to the front was to crawl on your hands and knees. And they were coming down here and they were doing funny things. They were taking their cigarettes out of their pocket and throwing them up on the platform. Nobody said anything about cigarettes. And they were, they were weeping and they were embracing one another. And they were finally getting to the platform and getting hold of the microphone and Manasseh had stepped out of the way and he had gotten over here next to Margaret and they were just both of going pray, pray, pray. And they were testifying of being healed. We were there we were there for another hour or hour and a half that night. All of the things that we had looked to happen the night before under the ministry of the great superstar that had not happened, happened that night 
because of two little black Africans from Kenya, West Africa, simply stepped in to intercede. That's all. God said, I looked around and there was no justice and no one to intercede for me. And then he said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will set them to flight. And I realized God is for us. All he needs is somebody who is willing to be available. That's all. That's all he needs. He doesn't need the superstars. He doesn't need the big names. He doesn't need the headline features. All he needs is somebody who will step in and will claim the power of God for the generation in which we live. Because everything else is already there. The blessings of God, the power of God, the promises of God, they're already in motion. So I said to my friend Mike the other day, the guy who was laying out there on his back in the driveway, who's had his guts cut out, and now the doctors are telling him that he's so infected with cancer that he's not going to live. And he came back to my house the day before we left. I went out in the yard. He was getting ready to get back up on top of my house. He says, I've got to do this. But he said, I feel miserable. He said, do you think I ought to work? And I said, Mike, work. Some place in this life, you're going to have to put your trust and faith in God. If God is for you, then who can be against you? Jesus said, I didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And I said, Mike, either you're going to have to believe that you're healed or you're not healed. And I said, go ahead and have your operation. I think that's biblical. I think that God loves to to cut out that which is evil. I have no problems with a surgeon going in and cutting off that that which is rotten, that which is evil, that which is infected, that which is diseased. God did that with Lucifer. When Lucifer rebelled against God and God cut him off, threw him out of heaven. And I said, cancer is the spirit of Lucifer. It needs to be cut off. It's a cell that's in rebellion. It's a cell that says, I'll do it my own way. So have it it cut off. Have the lymph nodes taken out. That's what the doctors want to do. Don't worry about that. But remember at the same time, you're healed. You are healed because God has said, I love my people and I want to bring healing to my people. So go ahead. Start living your life as though you're healed. Walk it out. Walk your healing out. I'm not talking about presumption that says, I will not go and have some surgery when it's necessary. Of course you have it. But you live out your healing at the same time. I think God wants to touch some of you here tonight. I believe this with all my heart. You're not here just to listen. You're not here just to be spectators of something that's happened. We've come together, but we've come together for more than celebration. We have come together to be touched by God. And I have not come here tonight, I've not come to England to to, to bring you to God. I've simply come to bring God to you. I've simply come to open a door and say He's here, and all you have to do is walk through it. It's yours. There's a lot of you here tonight who are struggling with things that you believe that either God put on you, or you're struggling with things that God wants to take off that the devil put on you. The enemies of God have taken control of some of you. You're living with disease that you don't have to live with. You're living with thoughts that you don't have to live with. You're living with all kinds of wounds deep on the inside, and you say that God has wounded you. God has not wounded you. God doesn't wound people. God heals people. God is a God who will lift the disease from you. All you have to do is present yourself and say, Lord, here I am. I believe. Belief opens the door. Faith opens the door for God to come in. All you do is take that step of twisting the doorknob and swinging the door open and God comes in. You say, well, I don't have enough faith to believe that God has healed me. You don't have to have that much faith. All you have to do is open the door and then God comes in and He brings His faith. I want to do something here tonight. I want to give you an opportunity to be healed tonight. I'm not talking just about physical disease, and there's some of you here tonight who are sick physically. But I'm talking about the things that you have lived with that you believe that God has placed on you because of the sorry kind of life that you've lived. Of course you've lived a sorry life. I mean, you've been bad. You're not okay. You're not okay at all. But God understands that. And He did not come to bring condemnation to folks who are not okay. 
He came to bring His deliverance to those who are not okay. That's why Jesus came. That's what this whole thing is all about. And so I want to give you an opportunity tonight to receive that which God has given you. Now, there's all kinds of ministry that can take place, and at different times it takes place under different ways. I believe in the elders coming and anointing with oil. I believe in folks gathering around and praying in tongues. But I think God has said something tonight. And I think He's saying, if you will just twist the door and open it, that He will come in like a flood and drive out the enemy. God will sweep into your life if you will open the door and allow Him to come in. Now, where are you with all this? Let's take just a minute. I want you to get quiet. What are the things in your life that the devil has brought in and has then convinced you that God has visited these things on you? And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke right now, Satan. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You don't have the right to come and lie to God's folks. You don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right to lie and to whisper in our ears and say, God's going to get you. Because we know our God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is not a God of condemnation, but a God who came into this earth to save us and to deliver us from condemnation. And we rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus right now. Father, I ask for your Holy Spirit to come now and flood through this room to drive out the enemies of God in the name and in the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. We cleanse this room of all deception and of all lies and of all discouragement and of all doubt. And I command you, spirits of deception and discouragement and doubt, to leave this place right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to be set free in Jesus' name. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to respond. And as you respond, if you'll do something physical tonight, as an action, God will move spiritually in your life. If you're sick, if you're discouraged, if there's poverty in your life, if you're living with an unhappy spirit, if you're still carrying the wounds from the past, I don't know where you are with all of this, but I think there's a bunch of you who are caught in this. God wants to set you free. And what I want you to do is I want you to stand and make your way as close to the front of this room as possible and just stand around the front of this place here. And we're going to trust God to set you free. Now, you're going to have to crawl out over some people to do this. It's going to be a little difficult to get down here. I'm not going to ask everybody to stand. Just those of you who are ready to come and say, I'm going to get serious with God. I'm going to open the door. I'm not going to live with this kind of garbage any longer. I'm going to be set free in the name of Jesus because God is for me. And if God is for me, no one can be against me. And I want you to crawl out over some folks and come. Come on now. And just stand right here at the front. And by your doing so, God is setting you free by your action in coming right now. God is setting you free. Now... If somebody's crawling over you, you reach out and touch them and minister to them in the name of Jesus. You minister as they come. You lay your hands on them just as they go by you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we're thankful for the deliverance that's taking place right now. We're blessing you right now in Jesus' mighty and holy name. 